All right, so let's put the technology back in the Skinner box. Remember the Skinner box at the beginning of the semester where we provide some stimuli, we provide some response. So how exactly do we play this game? Well, in psychology, there are a lot of theories about how we actually play this game of building and refining mental models, and they're often written down as a bunch of boxes and arrows, um, which becomes a cognitive architecture. And a cognitive architecture is kind of a, a loaded term because it can suggest that we know what's going on in the brain. There are seven different things your brain does in order to play this build a mental model game. Keep in mind that a cognitive architecture is really just a guess by a bunch of psychologists about how you actually do this. This seven stage process is probably not literally encoded in your brain. It might look like someone who's interacting with a new cell phone is doing these seven things. It's just a hypothesis, but it helps us think about this process in a little more detail and isolate some of the challenges of actually doing this. It sounds easy, right? You try something out, you see the sensory repercussion, you decide what to do next, but it turns out that in this process, there are two different gulfs that, you, that your brain needs to get over. The first one is the gulf of evaluation. So you have your new uh, cell phone, you do something to the phone, you get a response back, you see the response, you interpret your perceptions, and then you say, well, wait a second, does that new piece of, the new piece of information help me, or am I just more confused than I was before? How do we know, given this new piece of information, this new interaction with the cell phone, whether we've moved closer to our goal? Our goal might be to build a mental model. It may be to use the technology to do something. I don't care how it works. I just wanted to do something. I did something with it. Did it work? Am I getting closer to my goal? It's the first thing we need to figure out. Once we get over that gulf, we start to, for example, build our mental model and we say, wait a sec, we don't have enough information yet. I don't really understand what's going on. I need to do something else with the phone. I need to interact with it in a new way. What new way? What is the new action you should perform to get some more information out of the phone? So let's come back to the starfish here and think about the two gulfs that the starfish comes up against. So the same thing. The starfish says, I did something, the physical robot moved, and I got some sensory data back. Did that help me or not? How does it know? Well, the starfish gets over the gulf of evaluation by saying, I now no longer have seven pairs of sensor data. I have eight pairs of sensor data. I did something. I got this eighth piece back. And if that eighth piece allows me to find a new mental model that reduces error, the difference between sensor and sensor prime on all eight, if it got lower than even it was before when I only had seven pieces, then it was a good thing. I performed an eighth action, and that eighth action had new information, and that new information helped me, the starfish, to find a better mental model, something that explains all eight pieces, even better than I could explain all seven. If it can't do that, then the action probably wasn't helpful. If it performs the same action twice, nothing happens, right? It, it, it's sort of spinning its wheels. It can't make any improvement in mental models. It failed to cross the gulf of evaluation. It didn't do the right thing. If it says, hey, the difference between sensor and sensor prime is decreasing, I crossed the gulf. Whatever I just did was the right thing. Okay, so now it's done eight things and it starts to think about doing a ninth thing. What is the ninth thing it should do? It's gotta cross the gulf of execution. It's gotta decide what to execute or what to do next. We ended our discussion in the first phase with the starfish by saying it should probably do something different, right? Don't do the same thing. Don't even do something randomly, do something different. But what does different actually mean? It's a tricky thing to do. What the starfish actually does is it says, well, wait a second, I don't have one mental model. I have multiple mental models. And let's say in this cartoon example here that our starfish has these two different mental models. And it says, well, wait a second, these two mental models are both accurate, but they're both different. So I have to keep going, I have to do a ninth action. So it dreams up a new action, but doesn't perform it in reality yet. It takes that new action, supplies it to mental model one, 
and supplies the same action to mental model two and gets two different sensory repercussions from that one action. Model one rotates to the left or tilts to the left. Remember, the starfish has tilt uh, data. The second model predicts or tilts to the right. So I put the word prediction in here. And remember, we talked about the brain as a prediction machine. When the mental model takes in an action and produces sensory repercussions, that's a prediction. The model says, hey, physical, physical self, if you perform that action, this is what's going to happen. But model two says, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. So the two models are disagreeing in their prediction. Model one predicts that for this action, the physical robot will tilt to the left. This mental model predicts for that action, the robot will tilt to the right. Is this a good action for the physical robot to perform? Yes, right? So they can't both be right, right? One of these mental models has to be wrong, or maybe they're both wrong. Maybe the robot's going to tilt forward. So we know now that if the ro physical robot carries out this action, it's going to get a ninth piece of information that's going to invalidate one or possibly both of these mental models. So what the starfish is actually doing, it starts at the beginning by performing a random action, but the second through the 16th action are not random, and it doesn't necessarily choose the most different thing to do. It chooses the thing about which it's most uncertain. This is now an interesting topic in developmental psychology. Up until we published this paper, the thinking was that if you watch a human infant and they're playing with uh, toys and they're putting objects in their mouth, um, they're doing all sorts of things. It looks kind of random, that they're just randomly exploring what their body can do. But maybe infants are not doing things randomly. Maybe they are doing things actually very systematically. They are performing actions that weed out uncertainty in the predictions of their growing models of, of self. Again, we don't know, but at least for the starfish, this is the best way to proceed. So when the robot interacts with its world, it's interacting non-randomly. And an intelligent, uh, an intelligent user of technology might start by doing random actions, but then consciously or subconsciously, they will start to perform non-random interactions, interactions that are meant to reduce uncertainty in their model of the technology. So, uh, so back here, for example, they might very carefully choose ambiguous messages in which there are two mental models, one that says turn off X is in the options menu, and another mental model that says turn off X is in the messages uh, directory. They can't both be right unless that function is in both subdirectories, uh, sub, sub menus. So they're choosing actions consciously that reduce uncertainty. Aha, things that say turn on or turn off tend to be in options, not within the, the, the X thing, calls or messages. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so um, it turns out that building mental models and then using them for predictions is not really a straightforward thing. There's a lot going on under the hood and we need to keep that in mind when we're designing technology for people. Of course, there's lots of other aspects about interactions uh, with the technology that have uh, little to do with mental models. They're also, uh, they're not hierarchical and serial. They're going on in parallel. So in the starfish case, things are pretty simple. It would do one action, trying to learn a specific thing, then a second action, and so on. Humans are much more sophisticated. We are often, uh, we're often making predictions and judging whether they were uh, upheld or disproved at different time scales in lots of different ways. We may have intentions. I want the cell phone to do this. I've got a particular goal. I'm trying to figure this out about the phone. I'm thinking about different ways to interact with the phone. I've got different ideas about what may result. I have beliefs that I bring over from other technology. I'm frustrated. I don't have a lot of time. I'm only going to do two or three things, and I'm going to throw this phone in the garbage. Uh, or I'm on a bus, I've got lots of time to kill, I'm going to just play with my phone and see what I can get it to do. I am attending to the phone while I'm attending to other things. Obviously when we're dealing with humans, there's a lot of things going on, and they're all 
leading to parallel inputs to the device and parallel responses. Let's focus on just time scale. What are some interactions where we expect responses to come back at sub-second time scales? Um, when you move your eyes, you Absolutely. So when you wear VR goggles and you hold your head steady and your eyes move, as long as the image stays the same, everything holds up, right? Because you're just, like the Necker cube, you're just moving your eyes and you're saccading to a different still image because the goggles recognize that you haven't moved your head. So that's good. Let's stick with the example of the headset. What are some other sub-second responses that you might expect if you're wearing a VR headset? Uh, head movement. Head movement. So I move my head, but I don't saccade my eyes. Whatever I'm looking at on the inside surface of the goggles, whatever aspect of the screen I'm looking at, I move my head, but I keep looking at it. What should happen? The things that you see should move. The things you see should move. I might keep my eye on this part of the screen, but the object should flow in opposition to the movement of my head. And if that response happens any less than a few milliseconds, if there's more than a little bit of a, a lag, people feel nauseous or dizzy or take off the goggles, we're done, right? You have 20 or 30 or 40 years experience that when you move, the world immediately moves in the opposite direction. What are some cause and effect processes you engage in with technology where you don't have that expectation? Uh, right here. Uh, when you turn a system on. You turn a system on, right? It's going to have to do something to, to start up, right? We're all kind of used to that. The amount of time we might wait has decreased over the years, but we don't expect real-time interaction. Okay? When you start to develop your educational system for, uh, uh, for teaching ASL digits, there are certain aspects of your visualization that better respond in more or less real-time to the user, and you probably know what those are waving the physical hand and seeing the virtual hand move more or less uh, at the same time, and other interactions which the user is willing to wait a little while for, right? And knowing which ones the users expect or which cause and effect processes the user expects to happen at the millisecond level, the second level, seconds to years, uh, it's important to, to know what those are. So some other ones are moving a mouse, if you move your mouse and the cursor has a bit of a lag, again, that can be extremely frustrating. We've come to expect that interaction to be real time. Uh, entering data, starting up a computer, sending an email to someone. We know there's now a person involved and people don't necessarily respond in real time as much as we would like them to do so. We're willing to wait a little while, right? So we have all these other expectations when we interact with the device that have that don't necessarily have to do with the mental model itself. Okay, so um, humans build mental models, but the human brain has some limitations. Um, it's difficult for us to run simulations internally. You can close your eyes and chart a shortest path to the library, but if I picked a random building downtown and asked you to give me a detailed set of directions about the shortest path to get there, it's difficult to do, right? The mental models that we maintain are abstractions, right? They're not, they're not perfect. Mental models degrade over time. We forget things, right? If I were to email you five years from now and ask you the shortest path between building A and building B on UVM's campus, you might not remember the campus so well and be able to give me a good, a good answer. Our models are, bi are affected by bias and superstition, right? This is the way things worked on my own phone. I want them to work this way on my new, new phone just faster, right? Uh, that may or may not be true, but it biases the way I build up the mental model, and again, we adopt them from, uh, from previous systems. Okay, so how, do, how can we as HCI designers help people build up a mental model? We can, make, we can make this process harder or easier on our users. What are the design principles? What are the rules of thumb that we might apply to make this an easier process? We might try and provide a system image. So a system image is mostly the user interface, but also other aspects of the system as a whole. Is there an, is there an overall style to the system? 
Your style might be to hide most of the internals of the system from the user. If you ask anybody how Google works, they'll say, well, there's something where you type something in, and when I type it in, it goes and gives me back a list. For most people, that's their mental model of Google, and for most people, that's good enough. They don't need to understand the details of page rank and all the rest of it. It's good enough, right? So Google realized that everybody on the planet is going to want to search, so their demographic is everyone, and the majority of everyone is not going to care what's going on under the hood. Right? But it depends, right? How much information do you advertise about the internal structure of your, your system? That's part of the style or the overall system behavior. And then that informs how you might actually create the user interface or the documentation or the help system or the tutorials, what have you. You might rely on our good old friend, uh, the visual metaphor to help communicate information. So if you have a whole bunch of buttons, the physical proximity of buttons may tell you something about the underlying structure. So button one and button two are physically close to one another. They generally help with a particular kind of response. Button three and button four are close to one another. They are collectively responsible for response number two. And one and two and three and four are distant from one another. They have to do with different parts of the system. So distance now between pairs of buttons it is a metaphor for semantic distance. So semantic distance is things that are further away provide more different kinds of functionality than things that are close. Common functionality should be visible, should be easy to see on the screen, very accessible. Maybe things that are done very rarely or dangerous actions should intentionally be hidden away or made small or hard to access or written in red and covered in are you sure notifications and, and so on. What are some other visual metaphors that might help communicate the underlying structure of your system? So you're going, in a few weeks, you're going to be creating an educational system. And in that educational system, you will probably walk your, walk your user through a series of levels. Level 1 and level 2 are relatively easy. Level 4, 5, 6 are harder. How might you communicate that to your user? You could write a whole bunch of text saying there are a whole bunch of levels here, and the first ones are going to be relatively easy, but we're going to keep you from doing the later levels, which are harder and take longer, until you've accomplished levels 1, 2, and 3, and so on. Instead of saying all that, how might you visually show something that advertises that? I myself have noticed that if I hold my hand for like a duration of time, it starts to get tired. So for me personally, I want to create like a visual metaphor for like maybe balloons that are holding up the hands. So like subconsciously, I'm like not that, like freaking out to hold my hand. In one that could be right. So maybe the balloons are an advertisement saying there's some structure to the system. We're helping. We're helping your hand, right? You may not hold it perfectly steady, right? But we're going to, we're going to doctor the image of your hand a little bit as, as we go, right? It might be an advertisement that there is a part of the system, which otherwise might not be uh, obvious, which is that we're centering the hand, right? Maybe balloons or things that are pushing from different directions could communicate that part of the, the system. It's a good example, right? You're probably not going to write on the screen, um, we're capturing all the data from your hand in a NumPy array, and then we're centering the data using X, Y, and Z. But you could put something that says, the, the position of your hand in our system is not exactly the position in the real world. If you move your hand a little bit, that's OK. We, we're, we're providing a little bit of support. Other examples? Absolutely. So we could have a progress bar, how far through the system you're getting. There might be barriers placed across the bar, which say, that suggest there's some structure to the system. You cannot go to the next level until this bar is removed, which will cause your user to update their mental model. I get it. There's barriers in the system. I can't just arbitrarily skip to a future lesson. I have to progress. So their mental model will then make a prediction which is, how do I go about removing the bar? What do I need to do to get to the next level, right? They're playing this interactive game 
with the system. You've communicated some information, some structure. There are barriers, which becomes part of their mental model, and then they start to think about, use their mental model to predict. Well, I played video games before where there were barriers from one level to the next, and in all those video games, I had to complete level I before I could get to level I plus one. So what does it mean to complete a level in this new game that I've never seen before? Okay, I think we'll leave things there. You have a quiz due tonight, and we'll talk about deliverable six on Thursday. Thanks very much. Okay, so back to lecture. We're gonna, uh, lecture 11 is pretty short. We'll probably get through that and make a good dent in uh, lecture 12 today. So let's switch and talk a little bit now about memory, attention, and perception. And the three different aspects of human uh, cognition. Again, these things are very familiar to us because we're very good at it. Your memory may not be great, but it's probably not too bad. Memory is sometimes used as a noun and sometimes used as a verb. I have a memory of my grandmother and I also practice memory. I remember things, I memorize things. So when we talk about memory, again, keep in mind this is sort of a, a vague concept. We generally know what we're talking about, but sometimes we're talking about the thing, the memory, and sometimes we're talking about the process. When it comes to HCI, what we're usually interested in is focusing on recall and recognition and short and long-term memory, or working and long-term memory. Again, mem memory itself is a fascinating subject. We could spend a whole course talking about it and focus on just these distinctions and why it matters for HCI. We'll come back to that in a moment. Attention, again, is something that seems pretty obvious. Hopefully, I have most of your attention uh, at the moment. Uh, I may not have your attention for the entire lecture. You may find yourself daydreaming from time to time when your attention turns uh, inward, where you may be daydreaming, which we now know is not just an idle process, but you're refining your internal mental models, right? Any inner mental life you have, most of the time it's not just waste, <laughs> wasted time. You're building up an understanding of self, this lecture, something that happened to you yesterday, last year, what happened? Okay. Then we're going to talk about uh, the, the last part of the lecture today is perception. And we're going to distinguish between perception and sensation. So for our purposes in HCI, since visual sensation are photons that are falling on your retina, as long as your eyes are open, you don't have much control over that. You passively sense light out there in the world. Once you sense something, however, your brain takes over and actively starts to impose meaning or structure on those raw sensations, and you perceive things. What's important about perception compared to sensation is that it's an active process. It has a motor component. As I perceive the room, my eyes are saccading or jumping around uh, my visual scene and building up a 3D representation, a mental model of the classroom as it is this morning, right? Going from raw photons falling on my retina to building up this mental model. That process from photons or pressure waves arriving at my inner ear is the act of perception is translating that raw sensation into usually ultimately a mental model. Okay, and we'll talk about that and why that matters. Like we've talked about before, or like we talked about last time, we're often doing this in an active way to prove and disprove mental models. I think that is student so-and-so in the back, but their face is occluded, so I might move a little bit to prove or disprove my guess about who is actually sitting in the back of the room. Okay, so we're going to talk about these three aspects of human cognition today, but before we do, a little bit of a warning. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Uh, this is important for our purposes in cognitive psychology. Um, if you've taken my robotics course, we spend a lot of time talking about this. Clearly, you have memories of various things. You have attention that you can focus outward, or you can turn your attention inward. Uh, you perceive the world around you and so on. They feel like separate things. It's obvious how these three things work. A warning, they might feel like they're happening in one way, but in reality, they may have a very different form. To make this point about thinking about thinking is misleading, I'm gonna use a very uh, controversial example. I am not trying to convince you whether or not you have free will. Again, that is probably a subject best left for another class or another time. 
We're going to talk about the limit experiment in a moment because it's probably the clearest example of how often our thinking about a particular cognitive process, which in this case is free will or choice, if you like, is often misleading. Who has seen or heard of the Libet experiment before? Only a few people. Okay, you're in for a treat. Here we go. Um, it's been around for a while, obviously, in the early 1930s. Uh, Libet and some of uh, his colleagues invited some human subjects into uh, the lab. They, instru they instrumented them with uh, some electrodes, which are electroencephalographic uh, electro electrodes. So they're collecting uh, electrical activity that's near the surface of the brain, close to the skull. So EEG doesn't give you a lot of information from the inner parts uh, of the brain, but from the surface. But that's pretty good for our purposes because a lot of human cognition, sort of not the animal part, but the human part, the higher level abstraction, like building mental models and prediction and thinking about making a choice, tend to be on the surface of the brain. They implemented human subjects with EEG uh, sensors and EMG, electromyographic uh, sensors on the finger, which sense muscle contraction. So they're going to record electrical activities from the brain and muscle contraction. And they're going to measure uh, both of these signals over uh, a time period. What they asked the human subjects to do is to watch the face of the clock. And on that clock, there was a moving red dot. And they asked the subjects at any time that they want it to freely choose, I'm going to put free in quotation marks now, to freely choose at any point to decide to move their finger, and at the moment they decide that they should move their finger. So the subjects were asked not to cheat, to think, I'm going to move my finger and then not move my finger. They were asked to be truthful. Now, whether they did or not, it's hard to say. This is one of the issues with the Libet experiment. But we're going to assume for the moment that human subjects played this game honestly. They watched the red dot, and when the red dot reached a certain point, they decided they moved their finger and they reported back to the experimenter exactly what time did they make the decision to move their finger. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. What they found was that most of the time, the time at which the subjects reported that they decided to move their finger, about 200 milliseconds later, the EMG signal recorded that the finger actually started to move. So it seemed that most of the subjects were reporting things honestly. You make a decision, it takes a little while for that signal to get from the brain to the figure, finger, and uh, one-fifth of a second later, your finger actually moves. Seems pretty straightforward. It turns out that what they found is that for different subjects, there was, a, uh, sorry, they had individual subjects do this multiple times. I forgot to mention that. Every time a subject decided to make this, it might have been at different times, but at those times for a single subject, there was a particular pattern in the brain that was constant as reported by EEG. So they were using a machine learning algorithm. It was a pretty rudimentary one back in the 1980s. But it was enough for the algorithm to say, listen, subject three has played this game five times, and every time subject three reported that they chose to move their finger, there was a lot of differences across those five EEG snapshots, but there was one part that was constant across those five, uh, across those five EEG snapshots. For another user, they might have played the game seven times, that user also typically had uh, some part of their brain that was constant or pattern of the brain that was constant, but which part and what that pattern was obviously differed from one subject to the, not, the, to the next. Our fingerprints are all unique, so are our EEG signals. What was important is that they could isolate in the EEG some pattern that was only there when the subject decided to move their finger. The rest of the time, in here, and in here, that constant pattern didn't show up. So far, so good. Now, whether that part is the part of the brain that is making the decision, that's impossible to say. All we know is that when they made the decision for individual users, there was this constant pattern. Not so surprising. What was surprising is that for all of these subjects, 300 milliseconds earlier than the time at which they believe they made the decision, there was some other part of their EEG signal that was also constant across 
every snapshot or every time they played this game. Troubling. Why? Question? Well, yeah. Uh, humans aren't that good at timing down in milliseconds. They aren't, exactly. So there might have been there might have been a problem in the reporting and they tried to control from that for, for that. As the best as they know, and people who have replicated this since, the, from, as far as we know, the humans made the decision, and they're watching the clock is exactly when that happened. And they might have been off by a little bit, but they would have been off by different amounts for different people. So 300 milliseconds might not seem like a lot, a third of a second, but it's enough. It's enough of a lag to be a little bit disconcerting. Could it be because like, you actually have a process Possibly, right? So does it, did it take a while for the decision to actually manifest in your, your mind, right? You decide at this time, but you're aware of that decision, as far as the Libet experiment knows, at this time. But Libet and colleagues knew that you made the decision actually a third of a second earlier. So yes, it might have taken a while for it to reach the, constant, the conscious part of your brain. Question? Well, it could be the point at which you're deciding to find a point on the clock. Possibly. Like, like it takes mental faculties to read the clock precisely. That's it. You might be like, okay, I'm going to watch the dot and now. That's it. Possibly. So you can actually play this game without the EG and the EMG. Get a normal clock that has a second hand that's moving. It's got to be moving constantly. And just watch the clock and try and relax, and then at a certain point decide to move your finger and note the time on the clock. You may, you may realize that there's a little bit of uncertainty in exactly when you decided, but that uncertainty is probably less than a, a third of a second. Again, it's a short period of time, but still pretty long. Okay, so again, we could argue back and forth. There are some weaknesses with this, this approach. It was surprising to the subjects to be told, we know when you're going to make the decision. It's 300 sec milliseconds earlier than you think you made the decision. So if, it is, if the decision is happening in your subconscious and you only become aware of it 300 milliseconds later, you don't have any control over your subconscious. It decides and then tells you to move your finger. So also a little bit disconcerting. Okay. Again, I'm not trying to convince you that you don't have free will. One of the interesting things, many, there's many interesting things about the Libet experiment, experiment is that it raises some uncertainty. The subjects before this would have been certain that it was exactly at 2.7 seconds beyond 12 that I made the decision to move my finger, but it was not. It was 2.4 seconds beyond. Yes? So that wouldn't just be like reflex, like versus subconscious or conscious? So reflex over here? Yeah, like, so this part is not so controversial, right? This makes sense. I make a decision and I move. You know, it took 200 milliseconds for the signal to get there, plus the time it take, took for me to actually initiate the movement. It's this part that's challenging. This is all the stuff that's just going on in the brain before any moving of the finger. It's a lot. As you can imagine there's a lot that's been written about the Libet experiment. If you're interested, go and go and read it. It shows us that thinking about thinking is misleading, right? I decided uh, I'm going to have a ham sandwich for lunch right now, but maybe I didn't. Maybe my subconscious actually decided 300 milliseconds earlier or an hour earlier. I just wasn't aware of it. Okay. All right, that's enough about free will for now. So let's come back to uh, memory, attention, and perception. Um, again, just a warning. We're going to talk about these things as they're sort of separate processes. But they're not. They're just manifestations of behavior. So they are not only they are only not just separate processes, but they're also highly interdependent. It's hard to isolate any aspect of human cognition from other parts. But obviously, memory is a result of what we perceive. If you don't perceive anything, there's nothing to remember. Changes in attention change our perceptions, which change what we remember. Our memories shape what we perceive. This one is a little bit tricky uh, as well. What other connections exist? What other interdependencies are there between remembering things, perceiving things, and attending to things? How do these three processes influence one another? 
Yeah. Absolutely, right? So you may be remembering something and you may then go back to validate that in the real world, right? So your memories may guide what you, what you perceive. So again, we're going to talk about these as separate things. They're not separate. They're highly interdependent. Okay. As far as we know, there is no separate memory component in the, in the brain. Again, there's a fascinating ongoing uh, argument in the neuroscience literature about the modular nature of the brain. So in this part of the brain, there's memory, there's language, there's perception, there's attention, and there are others that argue that's misleading. The brain doesn't work that way. It doesn't have neat little compartments for the things that we perceive as separate, separate aspects of cognition, memory, perception, and attention. Okay, just again, something to, to keep in mind. Let's start with memory, and we're gonna play some memory games now. Like optical illusions, we're going to play this uh, game to see what aspects of memory are easy and which are hard, which matter when you go about creating an HCI interface. In order to play this game, you're going to need to have pen and paper. So if you don't have pen and paper on your desk, grab a piece of paper and a pen. I'll give you a minute to get ready. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to flash up on the screen for 10 seconds a, num a bunch of numbers. Do not write those numbers down. I want you to look at the numbers and memorize as many of the numbers as you can in 10 seconds. And then I'm going to flip to the next slide where I erase the numbers again. And the moment I erase the numbers, write down as many of the numbers as you can, as you remember. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, go ahead and write down as many as you remember. Thank you. Thank you. Only the ones that were like certain you remember? All, all the ones you can remember. Oh, the ones that you're certain to remember. Yeah, okay. It's up to you. I got three. Okay, I don't see anyone writing anymore. How many got one right? That's good. Keep your hand up if you got two digits. Three, four, five, Six, seven, some of you have had your coffee this morning, that's good. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right, well, we're gonna go Olivia. Okay, very good. Okay, we're gonna play it one more time. Different set of numbers. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay, go ahead and write down as many as you remember. <laughs> All done? Okay. How many have got one number right? Keep your hands up. Two digits. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Still quite a few hands at nine. 10, 11, 12, 13. Very good. OK. You can probably imagine in this game, many of you did better the second time. Some of you might have done better the second time because you figured out the game. But hopefully, there's another reason why you did better the second time around which is? 
chunking the information. If you've ever taken a psychology course, you've probably heard about this uh, before. Very hard to remember things when you're presented with a wall of numbers or text. Much easier when the information is structured in a particular way or is chunked in a particular way. This is not only chunking, but also trying to put the information together in a familiar form. Although, again, I realize this slide is a little bit dated. Do people memorize telephone numbers anymore? I don't know if that's even a thing anymore, right? I deliberately didn't put any 802s in there. That would have made things much easier on you, right? Then if I had put some 802s in there, we would have switched the game a little bit. Instead of playing the game of recall, which is just remember as many numbers as possible, you, remember, you recognize things, and then you don't need to remember the entire thing, right? 802 is not necessarily in your mind 802. You can just remember he put up a, a Vermont area code. So if he asks me, I know that I got 802 correct. So of course, this is not uh, an exercise about telephone numbers. It's remembering this idea of visual design. When you present information on the screen, or auditorially to your uh, user, you want to try and structure that information in a particular way that makes it easier for them to remember it or at least recognize it. So chunking is this idea. It's a very, uh, very popular idea. been around for a long time in psychology. Breaking the information up into manageable chunks. When your users use your, uh, use your ASL educational software, they're going to have to not only try and remember or learn the, the signs for the first 10 digits of ASL, they're also going to have to learn and remember how to use your system. Right? You could write on the screen a whole bunch of text explaining everything, but it might be good to break things down into manageable chunks. And it'll be up, for, up to you to decide how you want to do that. Remember in your final project that you're going to be do, doing user testing and you're going to be measuring user interactions. How long does it take your user to figure out how to play your game and move on to the business of actually learning ASL? It depends on how you feed the information uh, to them. Right? You might not only break up the information, but try and present information in a way that is familiar to them. What might be some familiar ways of presenting information in a user interface? Probably not going to rely on telephone numbers in the ASL educational software, but what are some familiar ways you might be able to present information? Headers and paragraphs. Headers and paragraphs, if we're going to do text. But remember, I'm not going to let you do text. We're going to assume that our users don't necessarily speak English as a first language. Absolutely, right? So demonstrations. Do what I do, right? So you see the hand in the screen do something and then it disappears. And that may be a nonverbal cue. Do what I just did, right? So the user might realize, aha, this system is trying to teach me how to play this game by doing a little bit of Simon Says. The computer does this and then I have to do the same thing next, right? That's sort of a memorable thing. I get it. I know what we're doing. And it's probably going to show me just one thing at a time, right? Here's how to center my hand over the device. And then it's going to show me, once I've centered my hand, how do I sign ASL? I might then see a short animation that does this, right? I don't necessarily know what that is, but I know that I'm supposed to do that next. It's breaking down the tutorial, teaching someone how to use your system into bite-sized chunks, and presenting it in a memorable way. We're going to play the imitation game back and forth. OK. OK, again, an example. I mentioned this before. I've tried to present you not with a wall of text uh, in this course, a whole bunch of uh, slide decks that are broken up into themes, which are put together into an entire course. Right? I've not only chunked the information uh, in this entire course, but presented it to you, or trying to present it to you in a hierarchical uh, manner. OK. OK, another important aspect of memory that matters for us is short-term and long-term memory. When you do user testing uh, at the end of the semester, you're going to get your user to play with your system for a few minutes. And then two days later, they're going to come back and continue using your system. You're going to do two sets of measurements, the first time they ever use your system and the second time they use your system, and they're going to be relying to some degree on long-term memory. They're going to remember what happened the last time. They could, of course, start from scratch and do the whole tutorial over again, 
But if you presented information in the right way, they might easily be able to remember it and know what to do the next time, uh, next time around. Okay, so again, uh, in the psychology and neuroscience literature, they often distinguish between short-term and long-term memory, and they talk about them as separate processes. They are probably not. They're just recognizable markers on a continuum of the way in which we remember things. But you've all probably had the experience of working, uh, working in short-term memory versus long-term memory. Uh, working memory doesn't tend to last longer than a few minutes. I'm not gonna do this, I promise, but next week if I asked you to write down the numbers from the memory game, probably wouldn't do a very good job, right? You, no need to move that into long-term memory, those numbers are not very important, right? So one of the things we do, or we seem to do, is choose or somehow move important information from short-term into long-term storage, and that process itself is kind of interesting. We talk about long-term memory or long-term storage. There's an interesting question about how much long-term storage do you actually have? How much could you actually remember? Nobody knows, but it turns out, as far as we can tell, that it's more or less unlimited. So there's an interesting calculation you can do, which is the human brain is typically made up of 10 to the 11 neurons and 10 to the 14 synapses. Let's imagine that you live for a hundred years. So imagine you live for a hundred years. Each year is made up of 365 days. Each day is made up of 24 hours. Each hour is made up of 60 minutes. And every minute is made up of 60 seconds. So if you are lucky to live to the ripe old age of a hundred, you will have experience in your lifetime three times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 3.1 times 10 to the nine seconds. You're asleep for about a third of those, so you could cut off a million, let's say 2.1 times 10 to the nine. You have 10 to the 14 synapses, and 10 to the nine, more or less, 10 to the nine seconds of waking experience. If your brain were to dedicate, what is that, five orders of magnitude, 10,000 or 100,000 synapses to recording, a snap, to recording a snapshot of every second of your waking life, you could store, in theory, every waking moment of your life. At the end of your life, while you're lying on your deathbed when you're 100 years old, you could recount every second of your waking experience, in theory. Right? Again, this is a little bit of very hand wavy. Are there people that do have that? There are people that have eidetic memory, which is where a lot of the experiments come from that suggest, as far as we know, it's unlimited. Now, do you need 10,000 synapses or 100,000 synapses to store the perceptions from one second of waking memory? No one has any idea. But that's a good amount of information to be stored. It may be possible. What would that translate into, like, bits? No one knows, right? How many bits of information can a synapse store? Actually, there are people that try and tackle that, that question. Not, not easy to say, but whatever it is, it's a lot. Right? Okay. Interesting to think about. I don't know about you, but I don't feel like I have unlimited long-term storage, but you have a lot, you have a lot. Okay, so again, there's no clear real dividing line between these two types uh, of memory but you've probably all heard these strategies for how to remember things and translate short-term into long-term uh, memory. You'll notice, if you think about these tips and tricks, they actually rely on some of the things that we've already talked about, which is that memory is an active process, right? Uh, raw sensation is a passive process. Things just sort of fall on our retinas or in our ear. But if we want to remember things, we need to act upon our raw sensations and perceive them. So you can do things like internally rehearse using your inner voice. If you spent the rest of this lecture telling yourself mentally the numbers that, we, that were in the memory game, and then next week I asked you, you'd probably remember more of those numbers. So if you actively speak to yourself internally, you can solidify some of that information. External rehearsal as well. Um, my high school locker, I don't remember what the three code combination was on the lock. But if I had that lock in front of me today, I could probably open it just through muscle memory, 
Right? You probably had that experience. Again, this is probably old fashioned now, but the old touch tone phone. Sometimes you would know a number where you couldn't say what the numbers were, but you could say, right? So there's something about action which also helps with memory. And sometimes action is more powerful than just mental recall. For some people, it's easier to remember this than it is to memorize 802 dot 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 dot. Okay. The more sensor modalities, the more of your five or six senses that you can bring to bear on recording an event, the more likely you are to remember it, which is why a lot of your teachers probably told you to actually write things down during lecture, read it aloud to yourself after class, watch the video, write it down again, rewrite it, uh, and so on. And especially rewrite your notes because you restructure the stimulus and you're sort of mixing up the raw perception, the, sorry, the raw sensation and pulling out or distilling the structure underneath. So sometimes the brain is lazy and will just memorize the shape of the numbers or whatever it is that you wrote down. But if you keep changing it, there's no specific detail for the brain to latch onto except the one constant signal, which is eight. Zero two. Uh, when I uh, when I wrote uh, this book that uh, I assigned as writing for some of the lectures with my colleague Rolf Pfeiffer, the editor uh, asked us to go looking for typos. And it turns out when you write a full length book, you can have the most high powered spell checker and grammatical system you want. There are still certain grammatical errors and spelling mistakes that will get through. So they gave us a little bit of a trick, which turned out to be quite helpful, which was to print the entire draft, manus the entire draft of the manuscript. I then took the last page of the manuscript and I read out loud the last sentence of the book on the last page. As I was reading it out loud, my colleague uh, Professor Pfeiffer was at the word processor and reading the words on the screen in the word processor as I read them out loud. Then I read the second last uh, sentence of the book, third last sentence of the book, and so on. So you can probably imagine it was an incredibly painful process to go through. Why did our editors ask us to go through this incredibly painful process? It forces you to actually really just pay attention to what you wrote. It forces you to pay attention to what you wrote. You can again play this game yourself. Take your notes and read it from the bottom upward and you will find all sorts of spelling mistakes and grammatical errors and things that are vague, because when you read it forward, what happens? You start to expect to read certain things. You expect or predict to see certain things, right? The brain is a prediction machine, which 99.9% .9 of the time is a good thing for us, but 0.1% of the time it's not helpful, like when you're trying to proofread some text, right? Uh, the quick brown fox, dot, dot, dot. Most of us would fill in jumped, whether the word jumped was there or not. Your brain is so good at making predictions, it'll make the prediction to say, yeah, 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 I'm pretty sure it's there, let's move on, right? You can break that process. The brain, when it gets lazy, that's all it does is make predictions. So how do you stop it from making predictions? Restructure the stimulus. Mix things around so the brain is actually confused and has to attend, which we're going to talk about in a moment, has to pay closer attention to the actual stimulus. Okay. We can break memory down into short term and long term, and we can also talk about recognition and recall. We already, you may recall, we talked about this already when we were talking about user interfaces. It's much easier to recognize something than recall it. You probably all had the experience where you say, I can't remember that word, or I can't remember where I saw that tweet, but I know, I know it when I see it. If you show me a bunch of tweets or a bunch of words or a bunch of images, I'll say, that was the one. That's the one I was trying to tell you about. I may not be able to call it up from recall and tell you exactly what it is, but I can tell you when I see it. It's much easier. One of the things that's important in HCI is to make things easier on your user. We don't want to tire them out and frustrate them. You would like your user to spend as little cognitive effort learning how to use your educational software and save all their cognitive effort for actually learning ASL, right? So maybe we can rely on recognition rather than recall, which was the basic idea behind the initial, uh, the initial graphical user interfaces. Before that, all you had was a blinking cursor and you had to remember all of the commands to type into a computer. 
A GUI presents information where you just sort of have to look, visually search for things, and recognize things. So if that sounds so great, why don't we all rely on WIMP interfaces, windows, icons, menus, and pointers? Some of us, myself included, still work at the command line. Why? Recall is faster than recognition. Recon recall is faster, right? Recognition requires you to scan the screen and find what you're, what you're looking for, right? So in order to recognize things, we're going to have to show you things. And remember our discussion about visual design. We want to uh, maximize the data to ink ratio. Ink is on the denominator, meaning we want to use as little ink as possible. If you go back and look at the history of GUIs, they used to have flashing icons, and the icons would move around and try and grab your attention. There was a lot of junk on the screen. Most modern GUIs have tried to remove as much as possible and present a clean interface. The minimum amount of ink needed for the user to recognize what they need, what they're looking for. Okay. Okay. And then also, depending on the user, it requires some intelligence to decide what to present, right? Pop ups show up because the operating system is inferring that you want more information. It may be right or it may be wrong. Okay. So, again, just an aspect of, of memory here, difference between recall and recognition, and how that influences HCI design. That's what we're looking for in these four lectures, is the connection between aspects of psychology and how that influences the design of interfaces. Okay, let's switch our attention and talk about attention now. Um, again, this one is kind of interesting because the psychology literature has greatly changed the way they describe this phenomenon. It's a very poorly understood cognitive process. It feels like it should be an easy process to understand, right? You're attending right now. Hopefully most of you are attending to my voice or visually attending to the slide. Some of you may be daydreaming. Hopefully you come back to reality and carry on together with the lecture. It seems obvious what attention is, right? It's this sort of beam that's out there, the searchlight that you're uh, you're wiping across your environment or perhaps turning inward. So not surprisingly, the oldest model of this in psychology matches, the, the earliest descriptions of attention match what it feels like to attend to things, right? Must be obvious. It feels like this, so that's what's happening. Remember our discussion about libid and free will. We just have, we can focus on one thing at a time and everything else is in darkness unless we move that searchlight and attend to something else, something else in our external environment or within. Not surprisingly, when computers came along, the metaphor that psychologists used to describe attention became more like processing power. You have a certain amount of attentional power and some people may have more attentional power than others. You may also be able to train to improve your attentional power. And you can then decide how to distribute that attentional power to different things. You can't attend to five different things in parallel, but you may be attending 90% to the actual content of this lecture and 10% guessing about how many minutes we have left in lecture, right? Maybe something like that. Maybe you may also be attending to something else. It gets harder when you get to three or four. But this idea that we're attending to one thing 100% all the time also doesn't quite seem, seem right. Okay. However, that implies that attention has this quantifiable capacity. 90% to this, 10% to that, which seems, again, like a bit of an oversimplification. Again, we'll, we'll just think about that for now. We'll put that aside. What's important for us in HCI is top-down and bottom-up attention, right? So uh, at the moment, hopefully, you're practicing controlled top-down attention. You are trying to attend to the content of this course. And university classrooms are designed to try and remove distractions so that you can do so. However, if there is a distraction, it becomes hard to ignore it and pay attention to the content of the lecture, right? So that's bottom-up processing. There is something that's happening in the environment that keeps pulling your searchlight. It keeps pulling some of your attentional power to it, and you can try and fight against it. It's a hard thing to do, and as you probably just experienced, it becomes pretty annoying pretty quickly, right? 
Very important when we're designing uh, when we're designing an interface, if your user gets into the flow of actually starting to learn some ASL digits, and then you flash up, flash up a message about other things they might be able to do with your system, pretty annoying, right? Or you put up a flashing icon in the top right uh, of, the, of the screen, they attend to that. Some of you are having a hard time not paying attention to the yellow truck out the window, right? Happens all the time, okay. Okay. So again, your attention can be switched internally. You make a choice to attend to something else. And unfortunately, the human brain isn't perfect. Sometimes things happen outside that makes it hard to not pay attention to them. And my little GIF in the top right isn't working. Uh, but usually it'll switch about every 10 seconds. So as we work our way through the slide, this is working. Every time that GIF changes or animates a little bit, your eyes saccade to that and then hopefully come back to what we're talking about. Okay, so some external stimuli are better at this than others at grabbing your attention. Things that move capture your attention. You've probably all been in a classroom where someone in the front row was watching YouTube and you couldn't help watch what was on their screen. Things that move tend to grab your attention. Things that are still and then intermittently start moving or make a sound intermittently, that is again very hard to not pay attention to. So you need to pay attention. All those things that are happening on the screen are in your interface that may or may not be distracting your, your user. The strength of a switching stimulus, the ability of something to grab your attention away from something else, depends, as everything does in this class, on external stimuli. So if you write some text on the screen and there's some particular information you want your user to pay attention to, you may change the color, change the font, underline things. Um, in the old days, there used to be beautiful websites that were written in all sorts of different colored fonts and different sizes. Uh, and so on. If there's lots of things that are changing or different, then your switching stimuli has to work a lot harder to stand out from the crowd and capture your attention. So a lot of early interfaces got into this unfortunate vicious cycle where they were not maximizing the data to ink ratio. They were splashing a lot of different colored ink on the screen, making these fancy pictures and animations because in the old days of web, de web design, it was cool that you could just do this at all. Remember in HCI, we're trying to resist the temptation to just do something because we can do it, right? Better to uh, present something that's a little bit more conservative, a little bit more low key, and then if you need the user's attention somewhere, you don't need to exert a lot of effort to capture their, their attention. Okay, so attention and distraction obviously are either sides of the same coin. Okay, we're going to move on to perception now, and in order to play, to un in order to understand perception, we're going to play another cognitive game here. As I mentioned, perception is an active process. So I'm going to show you an image in a moment, and you're going to uh, you're going to perform this active process of perception. In this picture, there's gonna be some raw sensation that's gonna fall on your retina, and the answer, the thing you're looking for, is in plain sight. It's right there, but it's gonna be hard to find. You're gonna to have to instead perceive. Where's the F? Hands up when you find, found it. Okay, all right, didn't take that long. No, I forget where it is. There it is. Okay. So take one second, two seconds. Not too long. Okay? Two seconds. Okay. And play exactly the same game again. Find the F. Found it. Okay. So again, not the hardest game in the world. It takes a couple seconds. I made it difficult on purpose. What did I do to make this game a little bit harder? There would be lots of ways to present this where you would have seen it immediately, right? You smushed it all together. I smushed it all together, but I smushed it all together in two different ways. Why? Mm -hmm. 
So if you go back and play this game at your leisure, right, you are searching for the letter F, but your eyes are not saccading in a random way. Remember our discussion about the Necker cube, right? The way that you scan the Necker cube, you're trying to prove and disprove mental models. When we perform perception, we're often bringing to bear our experiences from other similar uh, tasks. Why did I smoosh things together in rows here, but hide the F down in the bottom row? Um, well, the way I think of it is that when you try to scan it, you're doing left to right, and your brain kind of fills in the missing gap. That's true, right? So because they're smooshed in rows, like the, the game of the telephone numbers, this is suggesting something familiar to you, right? Lines of text, which normally if you're an English speaker, you read from top left to top right, next row, next row, next row. If I had put the F here, you would have found it immediately, right? So I designed this little interface here, this little picture, I designed it in such a way, which was the worst way I could have designed it, for what your goal was, which was to find the F. So this is a bad illustration, right? Because it's going against what you're trying to do. I'm actually making things harder on you rather than easier. Well, I actually found this one easier. Okay, how come? Because the difference between an E and an F is just that small line. Yep. And so I'm sort of looking for that white space. Uh -huh. The other one, there's a lot more white space. Very good point, right? So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes when we talk about gestalt perception. Gestalt is sort of the idea that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So for most of you, as you start to perceive the scene, you're not seeing little dashes at the bottom of the E's. You're seeing more or less one solid line, and you may or may not have been consciously aware of that. But there's a good hack. If you're looking for an F, you know, it doesn't have that little crosshatch at the bottom. So if you just look at this horizontal line and this horizontal line, you're looking for the little gap, right? The little space. So in a way, I also made things easier by smooshing things together. Here, again, as a native English speaker, your brain might kind of want to read from top left to top right. How many of you scanned top left, bottom left? And then next column, next column, next column. Some people, kind of. Usually this one's kind of hard, you kind of jump around. I should have probably made it more clearly columns rather than rows. If I had designed this in a way that more forcibly forced you to perceive this as columns, again, as native English speakers, even though they're columns, you probably work from left to right, and it would take you a while to get here. Right? So when your user is interacting with your system, they are performing this visual search thing. Where is the exit? Where is the next level? What do I have to do next? You want to try and design things to make things easier on them rather than, than harder.